Picture a group of soldiers in a barn behind the lines on the Somme. They've just been in the trenches and they've come out to rest and repair their equipment. They're sitting round in groups and one of the things they've got to do is de-louse their uniforms. Always a problem in any part of the battlefield. They're sitting round and they're talking. They're chatting. A trench chat. So welcome to another trench chat with us here on the Old Front Line. You've joined us for another Old Frontline Trench Chat, and I'm really pleased this week to welcome military historian and author Richard Van Emden to the podcast. Richard needs little introduction from me. He's the author of a wide range of some really fantastic books about the Great War, and I'm sure that many of you listening to this podcast will have come to the subject by reading one of Richard's books. Thanks for joining us, Richard. Pleasure, Paul. Now, we first met, I think, in the 1980s at a WFA meeting in, in Reading, Richard, um, so the Great War has obviously been part of your life for a, a very long time. How did you get interested? Um, back in 1984 or 83, my, my mother said to me, what do you want for Christmas? My, and my memory was, I said, it me any memoir of the Great War. I'd like to read it. And I think I'd seen a programme. I think that's what sparked my interest. And so she brought me Goodbye to All That by Robert Graves. And I read the book and I was just instantly hooked. And... Uh, um, I thought, well, I want to be, meet the veterans. I want to meet some guys who were there. <laughs> so I, I learned what the medal ribbons were, the Great War medal ribbons. And I went straight down to the Chelsea pensioners and started walking around the grounds. You can obviously just, it's free access. Looking, passing each veteran, looking for the medal ribbons. And I saw a chap called Ernie and just, I, I said, oh, you're, you're first war, I can tell. And he said, yes. And I, I mean, it was so embarrassing, the chap, because I knew nothing. But um, that's what really started it all. And once I met him, I just I felt I just have to meet the guys who were there and read as much as I can about it. And it, and it is a subject, I think, that if you connect to it in that way, it really grabs you, doesn't it? And you just you can never leave it alone again. Absolutely. I remember the first book I bought. I was a penniless student and I was standing in a bookshop in York and I looked at this book. In fact, I've only just thrown it away because it was rubbish. <laughs> I threw it away about a month ago. And uh, I stood there in the shop in York and I thought, if I buy this book, this will be the start of something big. If I walk away now, it will just be a side interest and I'll never really come back to it. And because, because it was, I don't know, seven pounds. And that was a lot of money for me as a penniless student to spend. And that kickstarted it. The moment I bought that book, I knew I was in. And what was that book then? Oh, God, some pictorial book of the Great War. I mean, it was just awful. And it's just been clogging up my shelves, and I thought I've never looked at it again. But it was, uh, it was kind of hard losing it, really, because it was the first book I'd ever bought. But, you know, I've got to make some space around here. So that was an important crossroads in your life, then, because that's taken you down a long and, and winding journey ever since. It has. I mean, I, I had no expectation it would last this long and, uh, and will continue to the day I die, I think. Um, it was just, originally it was just a hobby. It was something you know, I'd done stamp collecting as a kid. So I'd, uh, and I'd sort of fallen out with stamp collecting at the age of about 14. So between about 14 and 18, <laughs> very useful years, 14 and 18, there was this kind of void where there's this interesting girls, but absolutely nothing else. And, uh, and I needed a hobby. I've always wanted hobbies. I've always wanted something that would energise me. And, and the Great War has just provided me with, what, some, ooh, what, 30, 40 years? 40 years of fun? <laughs> and you've got your own connections to the Great War. I'm sure you told me once that you've got a, a connection to Ernst Junger, author of Storm of Steel. Yes, yeah. In fact, there's a picture of Ernst Junger with my grandmother in... Um, in Meeting the Enemy, one of my books. And uh, yes, yeah, she said um, she said he was a Spießer, which um, I, didn't, I didn't speak any German at the time. I barely speak any now, but it means he was a Philistine. And she didn't really like him at all, but they were at Leipzig University together. And he, was, he absolutely adored her. And he used to follow her around. And one of her stories was getting onto a tram in, in Leipzig and the doors were about to close. And he ran up to the doors and he thrust a pair through the open doors and she took it, and as the doors closed, she turned and handed it to a little boy next to her, and he sort of his face sort of dropped. But he chased her for a, for quite a long time, but she just wasn't interested, which is a pity for me. I loved him. In fact, he was there in 1986 on the Somme. I don't know if you remember that. 
Mm. And I went into Delville Wood, uh, the museum there, and someone said, oh, you've just missed Aunt Junior. He was in here half an hour ago. And I had no idea where he'd gone. I thought, wouldn't it be great to go up to him and say, guess who I am? Guess who I'm related to? Incredible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he was still coming back there in the 90s because I was meant to go to... Uh, a talk that he was giving at the Astoriel and I took my wow. first editions of his books. I had them all ready. And then, you know, he was an incredible age by then and he, he, he got unwell and he just didn't turn up. So I missed out on that side. Oh, he missed out on that. Oh. Yeah. We all have those regrets. Well, that's right. <laughs> um, so you mentioned there about going to the, to Chelsea to go and see the veterans and, and you, you spent a lot of time in that period in the 1980s and nineties interviewing veterans of the great war. That was, quite an experience really wasn't it oh god i mean i don't need to tell you i mean it was just wonderful and and i didn't i don't think i realized how lucky i was at the time i took it for granted i mean there was a time in the 80s when i had more letters from first world War veterans than veterans i've been veterans i could go and see so i'd have to kind of cherry pick them i mean can you believe it cherry picking veterans who am i going to see who's who's easier to get to um so it was just it was just such a special time because I mean there were some veterans that you kind of thought well I, I've met them once I probably won't meet them again you know their memories are pretty short or whatever and then there were those who were just gems and um, I mean Ben Clouting you you know about him the sixteen year old at Mons um, I mean to discover that the world's last survivor of a first shot lives two miles away from your house was just wonderful and I remember ringing him up and and getting his name and address out of, out of the kind of register of electors and ringing him up and just saying, oh, um, is that Ben Clouting? And, I, and he said, yes. I thought, oh, his voice was so strong. And I just thought, oh, that's his son. It's his son. It's not him. And I said, I'm looking for someone who was at the first shot. And he went, yeah, that's me. <laughs> you want to come and see me? I was like, oh, my God. Yes, please. And so you can see how energised I am. This is 30 years ago. Um, but I just, I saw him every, virtually every Sunday for two years. And we went back to the place where the first shot took place as well. We went back to that memorial on the Casco Road and, and it was just special. But he was one of, what, I mean, 270 or so that I interviewed in the end. But there was always about half a dozen that whenever I think about those who survived, there are certain, uh, Stan Clayton, I, that's one, and Vic Cole is another, people I, I always really turn to because they were just wonderful, wonderful orators. And they told you something that you can't get from the books. You know, it's just wonderful. I mean, Stan Clayton, you got Stan Clayton with a cut of beers down him. Oh my God, the stuff he would tell you that he wouldn't tell you if he didn't have those beers down him. And it was wonderful because you never get that from a book. And I won't even begin to tell you what he was telling me, but extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. And those connections with the veterans, I think, were very important, weren't they? That they, like you say, you, you, you spoke to a lot of them, but there were some that really stood out. And I, and I think that, you know, they, they were at a point in their lives where they obviously wanted to tell those stories. And it was great that they found people like you to be able to do that. Well, absolutely right. I think a lot of them realised it was two minutes to 12 in their lives. A lot of people said, oh, you must have had any number of veterans who said no. No, I had almost no refusals. I had ones who would, you could clearly tell weren't telling you everything, were holding things back and would give you a bit of a kind of pricey story. Um, but the majority would talk to you and, and pretty freely. And what you didn't want, and um, you may have found this too, was you didn't want family members in there. I, I had occasions where the daughter would sit in and say, oh, it's a bit hard of hearing and I'll, I'll help you out. And you think, no, no, no. He will tell me stuff that he won't say if you're, if you're in the room. I had one brilliant one where this veteran was telling you about the occupation of Cologne. He'd been through 1918, went to Cologne. And he said that his wife was sitting there and he said, uh, and he was talking about it was various stories. And his wife said, would like a cup of tea? And I said, I'd love a cup of tea. So she went off into the kitchen and went, right, quickly, VD in Cologne. And it just gave me this, like, really raced through it. And as she walked back in, he just, the drawbridge came down again. But I've got it on tape. I've got this kind of five minutes about VD and how it was treated in Cologne that I wouldn't have got otherwise. So, um, yeah, they, it, it, it was it, wonderful times, wonderful times. And I, I still look back and think I took it all for granted a little bit too much. Yeah, it, it seemed like it would never end, really, didn't it? I think that was the thing that, yeah. uh, you know, we, we were both a bit younger then. And, uh, and there were so many of them that, that it just seemed that they would never fade away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I got a letter. 
Uh, there were two incidents. One was a, 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 a vicar, I forget his name now, who was, he didn't actually fight, he went to Cologne, and my, Cologne's a big interest of mine. And I rang up, I, I left it a while, and I rang his home, and his wife picked the phone up, and I said, oh, it's the Reverend, whatever his name was then. And she went, well, he is dear, but he's dead. He died this morning. I had another, Robert Rennick, I don't know if you remember him, tw um, the King's Royal Rifle Corps up in County. We were on our way to film him when he died. I had another letter from a chap who, I forget, I forget the regiment, but he was at Bowman Hamill in November 16. He said, please come and see me. I'd love to talk to you. I left it a month. Then when I rang, the phone just rang and rang and rang and he died too. I mean, there's so many examples like that. Where, and also ones where you didn't, I didn't focus in. I didn't get what they were telling me. So I remember one chap called Genoa, whose brother was the famous case of, uh, who was murdered at Brandenburg POW camp as he was climbing out of the window. He was a burning hut. He was bayoneted and pushed back in. And there was a government white paper about it. And he said, oh, my brother was murdered by the Germans in the, in the Great War. He was, he was at Brandenburg POW camp. And I was like, yeah, but that didn't happen to you. And I'm talking to you about your experiences. So I completely ignored the fact that he was related to one of the, one of the great stories of the First World War. And I, because I didn't know anything about it. And so I just said, no, oh, let's just talk about your stories. So um, as many great stories as you pick up, so many, so many others just slip through your hands. Yeah, and I think that, like you said, at that point where they, be, where they did begin to, because, you know, the time caught up with us and these veterans did begin to fade away. It was quite hard, certainly for me. I actually stopped tracking them down because I was going to so many funerals and we were losing guys that were special to us and it was just hard to take on another one if you if you see what I mean yes well so many of them I knew that if I went to you know drum the drop it in Scotland I wasn't going to see them again and I would probably say 80% of the veterans I met it was a one-off um, but yeah there were those those dozen or more that you know the funerals you went to and the, 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 the veterans that you you, I still miss, I still miss today, and I still miss those questions I could ask them now, which would elicit so much more material, but which I didn't know at the time. And if only we'd have had iPhones to be able to record them in a slightly different way the, than the cassette recorders that we had. Oh my God, all my cassettes are all there in the loft. And I don't play them because I just think I'll put one in. I've got to, I've got, still got to take recorder, a cassette recorder because I know it. You know, one day I want to play them. But I just den because I just think it's going to screw. They'll be so damaged now that they will just screw up, and and I can't bear to do it. So I have all this material, but I can't access it. Precious archive, precious it. archive. Yeah. Now I know some some ac academic historians criticise oral history, you know, because it, it's relying on the memories of men who were uh, when we spoke to them in their eighties and nineties. So what's your view on that? I think I think every every period has its veracity. Um, and uh, you know, there was a story, there was uh, some veteran wrote in the 1930s, I mean, all right, this is only 20 years after the war, but he said at his time, he said, you know, I needed the sediment to settle before I could really explore my war and look at my war. So he was saying I needed 20 years afterwards. And some of these veterans hadn't spoken about it. I mean, Cecil Withers, who was one of the last I spoke to, really didn't speak about his war. And so what came out was so stark and so honest. That I, I didn't disbelieve what he told me at all. In fact, the bits that I could check up, he was absolutely spot on. So yeah, of course, there were lots of veterans who I met who, who whose mind was going all over the place. All they'd mix up events, and I could tell that, you know. You, you, but there was still some great truths to be had, and often it was the little anecdotes that really meant something, not the kind of well, I can tell you what was happening at Arras. Well, you know, you probably can't. You could only see two hundred yards in either direction. So it was the it was the small stories, the little things that that touched you, which you can you could get right up until the very end. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, Cecil Withers was 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 one. You're talking about the Battle of Arras and wanting to give a water bottle to a dying German, and this sergeant coming back going, "Sets Withers, push on, push on. You need not to give that swine any water." And he said, "That's hurt me all my life. It's hurt me all my life." And, you know, it didn't matter if you told me that at the age of 40 or the age of 105. It was still true. There were veterans who, who, who were genuinely dodgy. I mean, there, I, there are two in particular. One who claimed he was in the Ninth Lancers uh, during the fighting in 1914. And he'd been with the King's Royal Rifle, Second King's Royal Rifle Corps. I, his enlistment papers, unfortunately for him, they survived. So I could see he joined up in September 14. He'd gone to France in 
March 50. What on earth was he telling me about being in the Lancers in 1940? It just didn't happen. And I think he got this document, this, this memoir of somebody, and they just subsumed it into his, his own war story. And whether he believed it or not, I don't know, but he retold it as if it was genuine. And it was just ridiculous. And there was another who was a nurse as well, who was an interesting one because she'd been a nurse in the Second World War. So when I interviewed her, she sounded entirely plausible. I was thinking, well, this sounds really, you know, you look so young and yet, you know, well, I'm 97. Well, wow, amazing. You look in your 80s. Well, she was in her 80s as it turned out. But she just, she wore the 14, 15 star and the other medals. But then she told me she was only out there in 17 and 18. So when I saw her medals, I went, oh, you got the 14, 15 star. Went, oh, yeah, they just gave those away. I was like, ah, oh, right, okay. And lo and behold, yeah. But she'd been in the Second World War, so she could turn that story very easily into a First World War story and make me believe it. And so, yeah, there were people who were, I don't want to say phonies exactly. I mean, this chap in the Second King's Wrath of Corps had served, but why they felt they needed to embellish their stories, I don't know. I think there was a lot of uh, what I'd call estamine stories that came out sometimes where they'd they'd heard something over a few beers or a glass of vin blanc in yeah. an estamine um, and, and then they, they trotted that out all those decades later. But I suppose, you know, going back to your, your point, it, they weren't there to sort of recite the official history to us. It was about the experience of war and what it was like to have been in the trenches and seen all those things. I think that's what we got out of it and what fascinates people. Yes, and I, I really... I didn't have a problem with interviewing men who were 105 years old because I knew they were still there was still material there and 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 just to sort of write them off as oh they're all seen. <laughs> I give you one great story. When I did Roses of No Man's Land for Channel Four, I got said this is this is how you should never 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 sort of take umbrage for too long. A chap wrote to me. We we put an advertisement in the paper. Do you know a nurse of the Great War? And I got lots of letters from people saying, "Yes, my aunt Fanny was, and she died ten years ago." But you missed out. And I got a letter from this chap. And he said, "You cannot be serious." He was doing the kind of John McEnroe. You cannot be. All these nurses are senile or they're dead. You won't get anything. And I thought, right, okay, we'll. Get, I'll keep that. I'll keep that letter. So when the program came out, we'd interviewed about twenty Great War nurses. I sent him a production card, and on it I just wrote, safe. <laughs> and I just, underlined it. And I got a letter back from his wife saying, oh, my son, remember my husband writing to you? He was killed in a car crash a week later. I'm not sure enough, but i have taken umbrage for a year going, I'm going to get this guy. And uh, so, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, there were those people who just said, you're mad, you're insane. If you're not insane, they will be. What's the point? And actually, I've got so much great material from these guys right until the end. And, and now, of course, post the centenary, people who are still coming to the subject of the Great War, they look back on things like that and they're absolutely fascinated by it. Yeah, they are. And, and someone was tweeting the other day just saying, God, you're so lucky to meet these people. And I just think, God, yeah, I was. We were. We were. Uh, it was just just such a wonderful, wonderful, rich period. And um, And, you know, you'd go around the houses and they'd pull out photograph albums or they'll pull out you know bayonets or pickle halber and you know Richard Hawkins with his pickle halber there and his periscope and he just oh my god this is so this is so so consuming and it did consume me for years and years and years in fact I was thinking should I do the same for the second world war as I did for the first world war and you know I can't I don't have the energy to get in a car and drive to Norwich and then drive to Drum the Drocket and then drive to Preston I just don't have it anymore. And I just thought, I'm going to focus really on the stay with the First World War with an occasional delve into the second. But I can't do it again. And I don't, in a sense, I almost don't want to do it again because I don't want to go half measures. You know, it was full on for 20 years with those veterans and I, I didn't regret a minute of it. It was a right place, right time uh, in our lives, I think, as well as theirs, uh, for all of that to come together. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it was because so many of them said, I wouldn't have spoken to you 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you know, but I'm willing to do it now because they knew it was, it was the end. And if they didn't tell it, if they didn't talk about it, it was going to go to the grave with them. And there was that little thing in their head saying, I haven't spoken to my family about it, but I do want them to know. And uh, we were fortunate recipients of that. Now, you mentioned Ben Clousing, who I know was a very special um, person to you. And, but, of course, one of the veterans that you're best known for is, is Harry Patch and how you were able to help him tell his story of the Great War. 
and he's become really almost a symbol of that Great War generation. How do you feel about that? And how do you think Harry would feel? Oh, he was a bit embarrassed about that. I mean, he said that the only reason why I'm getting any of this treatment is because I've just carried on breathing. You know, I'm just alive. He said, and he said it also annoyed him a bit. He said, that everyone's interested in the four months, was it four months, three and a half months I spent on the Western Front. And yet I've got 110 years besides, which is why I wrote it, it, in memoirs. I said, well, come on then, let's, let's, let's tell your whole story. Let's put it into some sort of context. So um, I don't think he wanted, I, well, he was Mick. He enjoyed the kind of, assets that went with this he enjoyed the trips to buckingham palace and he enjoyed going to number 10 and he enjoyed being fated um and uh you know but it, his battery life was only so short so he would get very very tired but who wouldn't enjoy that that that, that sort of uh, you know not celebrity exactly but um this sort of fame that he got but he didn't he, he knew he didn't deserve it and in a sense he didn't want it but of course you know he kept him going for another five years i'm absolutely sure um, so it, I think he had very mixed feelings about that. But I, I guess that he's, he's come to almost immortalise that generation, rightly, rightly or wrongly. I mean, I can get on a, on a coach with 40 people who've never been to the battlefields before. Yeah. A very high percentage of them will know who Harry Patch is. And that's, that's incredible. When you think back to the 80s, when no one really cared about the First World War, and Harry Patch, an ordinary soldier in the DCLI, is a household name. Well, it's a great name. I mean, it's a kind of Harry Patch. It has a sort of resonance about it. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he was lucky because, you know, he kept his eyesight. I mean, I, you know, all the veterans I met, no matter how good their eyesight was in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever, they were, you know, people like Henry Allen were blind for the last five, six years. Harry had 20-20 vision. It was extraordinary. He could see any distance, any amazing. So he's he could interact interact with the world around him, and he also kept his his, his mind right until the end, which was what I mean. The last Great War veteran could have been bedridden and senile, and and we would never have heard anything about him. It was just that he could actually get out of you know get out of his chair, get in the car, go up to the cenotaph. He could go to Buckingham. He could go to the Albert Hall. So he could just, he could, he could be part of life. And so people love that about him. They love that, the, the, the fact that he could interact with everything that was going on. And that's what, that's what made him so special. But we were very fortunate. I mean, it was extraordinary. I don't remember that, that last visit to the Senator, those three veterans met. You know, we had Henry Allingham, Royal Naval Air Service, RAF, Harry for the Army, and uh, Bill, Bill, whatever his name was, for the, for the Navy. I mean, what an incredible, what a remarkable chance that you, the last three represent all three uh, arms of the services. It's incredible. It is. And I think, uh, you know, during the, the Great War centenary, the, uh, I think it was a very positive period uh, for interest in the Great War, but a sad one, I suppose, for us in, in that the veterans were the missing element of it, that that generation had gone and, uh, and, and now they, they lived only on in memory. Yes, well, you know, we were over there in 1986, 1991, 1996, and there were veterans, albeit fewer each time. Um, you know, I remember standing there at Lot Nagar in 86, and there was Josh Grover, you know, with his original chin hat. There was, um, oh, what's his name from the Northumberland Fusiliers? Oh, God, the name started, I'm starting to forget. Um, Harry, oh, Fellows. Okay, Harry Fellows was there. I sat with him in a cafe a couple of hours later, and he, signed a book of his poems to me and uh you know and again you know i noticed somebody uh, uh put a thing on who who's this guy from 1991 and it was, it was um oh, i forgot his name booth um somebody booth of the uh, west riding regiment and it's funny because i just i instantly remembered who he was even though he actually was one veteran i didn't interview and i never got his autograph uh, Harold Booth, was it? Anyway, I just, you know, just these names just shot back into my head as to who they were because you sort of watched them. They were like mini gods yeah. as they walked around. You know, just, in fact, I'll tell you one story. It was the last time Harry went to the Menning Gate in, when he was 110 in nine, uh, 2008. And as we came out, and there were so many people there, and they were all milling around, one person actually came up and said, Can I touch him? And I said, You can shake his hand, <laughs> you know, but it was kind of like, no, please this is ridiculous this, he's just an, he's just an ordinary guy and he could be cantankerous and difficult and everything else he was just you know but that was the way that they were elevated and in a sense i was i was kind of guilty of that at times too 
you know, that's, we're just normal human beings. Well, that's right. I, I think the reverence in which they're held is a good thing, but I think it has, it has its, its downsides. But I suppose it's important to then make sure that the story is grounded in the fact that they were just ordinary men. And I think that's certainly something that comes across very strongly in your books. Well, I, I feel I would do them a disservice if I made them out to be hu- superhuman, because that would just be a lie. A lot of them um, were, you know, did some pretty difficult, naughty things over the years, you know, things that they regretted. Things. That, I mean, there were, I mean, what was it, Henry Allingham? I mean, his, he didn't see his daughter. You know, they were estranged. And it turned out when he died, she was still alive. She was 89, 90 at the time. You know, and, and Harry fell out with his two sons for different reasons. You know, they were all sort of, these, these were not, these were just everyday guys caught up in extraordinary circumstances. And, and but they have, ju- they had just the same regrets and just the same feelings of guilt about things as we do today. You've, uh, you've written so many great books, Richard. Um, and one of the things I especially like in, in, in the books that you do is the use of private photographs that are taken by the soldiers themselves. You've quite a collection of these, I believe. Well, it's funny enough, I was just looking in my uh, book in, of um, uh, the book I wrote in 2014, which is really the first one where it was completely about photographs, Tommy's War. Um, and in it, I say in the introduction, I've got 2,000 photographs, uh, privately taken photographs. And I did a count recently, it's got up to 8,000. So I'm, I'm, I'm wealthy in photographs and <laughs> bankrupt in monetary terms. But yeah, I absolutely adore that, that little window, that private window you get in on, on, a, on a soldier's service. It's like having a sort of special communion with them. You know, you're in the trench with them with their photographs because their photographs are different from those taken by the official photographer. I'm not saying that there are pictures I've gone, oh God, is that a privately taken picture or is that one that's taken by an official photographer? But there are moments, there are certain aspects. I mean, not least that they tell, you know, they often write in their, in their photograph books, this is Bill Smith and he died a week later. And photographs which, which are fairly anodyne become special when for example there's a picture i've used in my song book where it's a gun crew in the winter of 1617 it's a battery and um uh, it's, and the picture slightly shaken them it was freezing cold as you know they, the camera was quite awkward to use it with, with frozen hands so the picture's not even a great picture but the caption said these men were killed six hours later and they took a direct hit then the picture becomes really special and really moving so and also, you know, men just react differently. If you've got a, a camera and it's your mates, they will just react differently to you than if you're the official photographer coming down the trench with a packet of fags going, lads, you know, stand there so I can take a picture of you and here's a, here's a fag for your reward. So that, that I, I, I love them and, and they keep coming up. I mean, I bought these actually. I, I, this, is, this, is the one, this is the ones I'm most pleased about recently. Where, was the book here um, from Mons uh, to Eve, the, the Frederick Coleman book. And here we have, you know, the, the pictures he took or he had access to uh, in, in, in his book here. And then here's the original oh. photograph that came up as a collection um, with the annotations on the back. Wow. So all the pictures that he contributed, not quite all, I think there's a few missing, but basically all the pictures he used in his books, and here they are, Wow. all personally annotated, appeared at an auction about um, three months ago and i couldn't believe i couldn't believe i got them i was i mean i would have got them because i'd have paid the earth to get them but nobody really went for them no one sort of noticed them and so i'm out there all the time scouring these photographs because they absolutely float my boat i love them i can't get enough of them but they're bankrupting me yeah they they do give us though a very different insight into the war like you say that they're not although there is posing goes on in them it's a different sort of posing and i think possibly that reflects the types of cameras that we use where you could take snaps whereas official photographs took a bit more composition yeah i'm always intrigued by the fact that you know we talk about sort of loading and aiming and shooting i mean not loading now anymore obviously but you know until very recently that's what that was the terminology and yet it's such a military you know we load aim and shoot our rifles and 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 equally you know this idea of a snapshot well that's exactly a snapshot with a rifle so um i'd love to make that connection i've never been able to um but yeah the the fact that the vpk the vest pocket codeout was the kind of ubiquitous camera on the western front they took them over in their thousands and what i'm actually trying to um 
trying to uh, uh, discover as many photographers as I can so I can make, make some sort of assessment of what sort of units were they kitchener men were they regular army when did they give up their cameras did they carry on photographing what did they photograph was it back areas were they willing to front lined to try and make some assessment of the men who were taking these cameras to the Western Front. And that's never been done before because no one's ever actually bothered to collate who was taking them. The problem is, of course, that you can have a great photograph album from, a, from an officer, but you don't know for sure that he took those photographs. That could be a fellow officer who gave prints to his, uh, his, his friends. So um, I, I don't quite know where the assessment's going to go, but I've got, I've got 260 names and 260 regiments at the moment. So I'll build on that and hopefully maybe end up around about 400 when I make my assessment. And it seems to have gone on. I mean, we tend to think that the, the army outlawed it, which I know there are, there is evidence of that early and early on in the war, but there are plenty of albums depicting 1918 that, that turn up. Uh, not as many as 1914, 15. I mean, uh, I, 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 I don't know actually number how many albums I've got, but um, uh, the vast majority are we, we, when, Conversely, there were far fewer men on the Western Front. Um, the number of albums I've got from 14 and 15 way outstrip those I've got from 17 and 18. But they, you're right, they, they, they were still out there. Um, and, uh, and you pick them up every now and again. In fact, Simon Jones has picked one up recently. He's been putting on the Twitter. It's an amazing album from a man called Hallington or somebody. John Hallington wonderful photographs from 17 and 18 and i was just like oh god <laughs> jealousy <laughs> coming out my ears but uh but yeah i mean the band came the, the first band came on the 19th of december uh and was i mean it was pretty roundly ignored until march when they they clamped down but interestingly enough it, 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 their officer saying oh the order was retracted for about a week at the end of march and then it kicked in again in the middle of april and then it really kicked in just prior to loose they were so nervous about spies and about information getting out that they really clamped down at that point but it is noticeable how many men still continue to take photographs and i've come to the conclusion it's about what's your attitude what's the co's attitude if he says look for god's sake don't wave this around in front of a because he trots past you know just be sensible and i will turn a blind eye then they tended to carry on because obviously within the unit, if the CO said you will get rid of your camera, then they got rid of their cameras. Um, and uh, it's a fa it's an endlessly fascinating story and the one I want to pursue for a long time to come. And and I think it's all part of um, the idea that the Great War, you know, it's not it's not over. The the last word on it's not been written. The last image has not been seen. It's still very much a, a vibrant, vibrant, evolving subject. Absolutely. I mean, there are some pictures I've got which are just historically important. I mean, there's one where you can see the guns of L battery on a train going to England. So you can see the damage on the guns and you're looking at it going, oh my God. And the guy's written your L battery as, it, as, it, as the guns are taken home. And you're going, that is amazing. That is such a historically interesting photograph. I have to say that I was gutted because the picture of the gun, the two guns you can see, isn't the one you've got that the Imperial War is in. So clearly that was further down the carriage or further down the platform. And I was, I was hoping that one of those two guns would be the one at the IWM. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are lots of stories to be written yet. And also, you know, people say to me, they said, oh, well, yeah, surely everything has been written about the Great War. No, 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 no. The more you delve into the Great War, the more stories there are. And uh, I mean, Peter Hart has done a great book on the evacuation of Gallipoli. And I had my eye on that. I thought, that is a fantastic story. And, um, and he's got in first. <laughs> but that was one, you know, like people have talked about the evacuation, but not in any great detail. And that is a story that had to be told. It's so enthralling. So there's lots and lots. I mean, I've got, I, on the left-hand side of my map, I've got a, sort of on the screen, it's got 10, my next 10 books on the Great War. And what I do is I hoover up material. I go, oh, what well, that's useful i'll put that away to one side so when i actually start a book i've probably got 70 80 percent of what i need already because i've been collecting it for the last god knows how many years and there are so many great stories still to tell and um uh and uh, yeah i'm chipping away slowly at getting those done great are you working on something at the moment well, I'm just doing the update of Boy Soldiers, a final update of Boy Soldiers. So um, I've got uh, my top 50 youngest 
on the Western Front. And they all have to be, or Western Front or Gallipoli, and there's a couple in Mesopotamia as well. Uh, but they all have to be under the age of 15 um, to make the list. So I've got my top 50 of those, um, including three who were 13 on the Western Front. Wow. Uh, and um, I've got uh, my top 10 youngest officers and my top 10 um, youngest uh, award winners, so DCMMM, whatever. So I'm plugging away with that, but I've also got a lot more new material on the Boy Soldiers, which I think, right, this is the final update. I won't be another one. This is going to be the final update with, with, the, with the additional stuff I've got. And I've done, <laughs> Paul, the thou, I mean, I wouldn't even say thousands, tens of thousands of hours I've sat on Ancestry, flicking through service papers, just i cannot tell you nobody in their right minds would do this and that drives me on because i think okay no one would do this no one can replicate this because no one's going to give basically 10 years of their life to, to, to trawl to do this this research and i noticed on things like the great war forum people kind of poo-pooing the numbers i'm telling you paul if they are absolute they are low they are low i can prove that it's probably well over 250,000 wow. serving. No, not all of those go to the Western Front. A lot of them don't. And I'm still trying to get the balance between how many enlisted and went to the Western Front and how many actually were discharged. And I probably won't ever be able to sell precisely, or probably within 5 or even 10%. But the numbers, it would, however I look at it, whatever angle I come in statistically, it's saying the numbers were massive. And I probably, if anything, underestimated them. And, and it's such an important side to the Great War. And I think that, particularly with school groups, is that the children perhaps feel distanced from it because it's over a century ago. But then they start to see stories like the ones that you've told about teenage Tommies. And they realise that actually these men were only so often the same age as them or very close to their age. And there they were in the midst of this war. Well, absolutely. I mean, I look at my own son, Ben, named after Ben Clouting. Um, uh, he's uh, 13 and what is he now? 13 and five months. Well, he's now older than Sidney Lewis was when he joined the British. In fact, older than Sidney Lewis, not when he joined the British Army, when he went to the Somme. He's older than he was when he went to the Somme. And um, it's just, you know, I look at my kid and think, my God, you know, you put a rifle in his hand, are you kidding? Um, but uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great way to get children involved and interested. I mean, they all go and see Strudwick's grave. Of course they do. And I have very, very mixed feelings about leaving teddy bears all over his grave and things like this. But as a way into the subject, for, for if, if it inspires, you know, one in a class to take the Great War seriously and, and to get interested, then fine, you know, um, I, I'd love that. I mean, the, the last time I ever got a signature for, of Harry Patch was, a, and I, I refused, but in the last few months I said, no, no, no more signatures. He, he's, he's beyond that now and he doesn't want to do any more. And this 16-year-old wrote to me, said, could I get his signature? And I thought, no, no, I've said enough. But I thought, he's 16. And he's showing a real interest in the Great War. So I said, look, I'm going to see him next week. And this was only about 10 days before he died. I said, if he's upright, if he's in, sitting, sat in the chair and he's willing to do it, I will try and get you his autograph. But I don't know whether it will happen. But I said, okay, I'll take it. So I took it down there. And then, of course, I thought, hang on a minute, this kid can't get the last ever autograph of Harry Patch. So I thought, I'm going to take two copies. So I took my, another copy down with me. I thought, if he can sign one, he can sign two. So he signed both of them. And I just said to that boy, that boy was so thrilled. Now, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't know what's happened to him. I might have flogged the book up for all I know. But he was someone who wanted to get interested. He was inspired. I'd come across him a couple of times before, so I, I, I assume he's still interested. But I wanted to anybody was going to get an autograph it was going to be a 16 year old lad because i wanted him to get into the great war as i did and to take that history further but so yeah the, the kids the kids are inspired if they go and see strudwick and you know if, if they want to write a poem or whatever fine just get them into the great war they'll they'll see that maybe some of the feelings about strudwick may be a bit off the mark but it doesn't matter you know that will come with experience and I think that nicely brings me back to Ben Clouting and Harry Patch. I mean, that generation has now left us, as we've said, and, uh, you know, you and I were so incredibly lucky to, to know men like these. It's important, important isn't it, to, to keep their, their voices alive still? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, it was interesting, actually. 
the whole way that the centenary was commemorated was kind of it was it was it was lovely in one way but it was a missed opportunity in another and and i looked at some of the programs that came out i thought they're really not not very good and they're and I, I thought of what could have been told the stories that could have been told over that period and certainly to have sort of challenged more the you know lines led by donkey's thesis which is still being propagated everywhere you look um so you know if i you know, I, I've noticed, I've noticed on Twitter, young people getting interested in the Great War, whether they numerically replace our generation, or heaven only knows. But I want to inspire them as much as I can. And people like Ben Clouting, if you can go to that place where the first shot took place and you think, God, he was only 16 and I'm 16, there will be that kind of connection across across 100 years, which hopefully will, will lead them on to bigger and better things. Absolutely. I, I just think that the whole story of the Great War is so powerful that... Uh, uh, it, it won't matter whether it's a hundred years or a thousand years, people will still look back on it and, and see uh, the stories of men like Ben and, and Harry that you've told and, and that, that war will never be forgotten. I, I sincerely hope so. I really do. I, I, it's been such a rewarding passion for you and for me that for that to kind of just dissipate and slowly kind of sink into the sands of time would be would be sad. It, there's so much to learn from these individuals about fortitude, about comradeship. There is so much they can give us from beyond the grave. Um, and it's so accessible. I mean, you know, we're not going to Iraq, you know, we're going to the Somme. You know, it is just three or four hours away if you live anywhere like sort of south of Nottingham, it's, it, or five hours. It, it, it's reachable for a weekend. And, and to explore the the, the battlefield is is so oh, it's so uplifting and it's so interesting and I, every time I go there I see something new and um, I don't go there enough I mean I wish you know I've not been there for eight well for getting in fact I had an unbroken 1985 to 2019 and 2019 was the first year I didn't get to the song and uh, I'm not almost about the 28th of December almost drove got in my car drove over there to keep that kind of year on year thing going i thought that is ridiculous you're going to pitch up there walk around for 10 minutes and drive home you know forget it but i can't wait to go back because it offers so so much absolutely it's that that, that big connection between landscape and memory i think that's uh, the eternal fascination of the battlefield of the great war that you know we can stand in a field on the somme and think of the stories of men like that and everything that unfolded there and it makes it a unique landscape and, and to get so close, so close to where, where people are talking about, and I'm not just talking about you know, the sunken road that everyone goes to, it's a fantastic location. But I mean, even with Harry, you know, when Harry was, uh, went over the steam beak, uh, the attack at Langemark in, in August of 17, when he described it, he described it so accurately that when we placed that memorial that he, he paid for, wanted to do to the, to the men of his division, it was about a metre, a metre and a half away from where he'd actually crossed the steam beat. Because I first subsequently found a photograph of the pontoon that he crossed over. And he's literally a metre and a half to the left of where he said, this is where I went over. It's, a, it's extraordinary that you can do that with war. And particularly with the First World War, there are instances where you can go, I know I am within 20 yards at most of where that individual was all those years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I could talk to you all day, Richard, about this. You know, uh, it, it is such a fascinating subject, and um, you've written some just incredible books on the Great War, and, and it's a, a fantastic you. legacy. Um, and it's important, I think, that, uh, that 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 continues. So we look forward to your next book. Thank you, thank you, Paul. It's been a great pleasure, and I can't believe that that best part of an hour has spun past. It's, it's felt like five minutes. So thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. Pleasure. You can follow Richard Van Emden on Twitter. I'll put a link to that on the podcast website, oldfrontline.co.uk, along with a, a few photographs of Richard and Ben and Harry Patch. And don't forget to have a look for Richard's huge array of books about the Great War, available from all the usual places, but do try and support your local independent bookshop, particularly after these recent times. And with that, that ends this episode of The Old Front Line. Next week, we'll be back in Flanders, and I'll be reporting from a recent trip to the Western Front. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reid. Do take time to subscribe to us via your favourite podcast service. 
Tell us what you think using the hashtag OldFrontline. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcore, and the podcast has its own Twitter feed now at OldFrontlinePod. And have a look at the podcast websites, oldfrontline.co.uk. Until we meet again, along the old front line.